Hey, rent to retires. It's Adam Schrader here for another episode. And I am once again joined by the man of the company, Zach Lamaster. He is here with me. And today we have two very special guests. They are tax strategists for real estate investors, and they are Jim and Lorraine. Jim and Lorraine, thanks for joining us today. Thank well, thank you. you for having us. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. So before we go too into depth, what is the definition of a tax strategist versus like a CPA or a tax accountant? How? Let's start with that. How do you differentiate yourselves? Well, what's interesting is I like sports analogies. And so I'm going to use a soccer analogy. If you think of your current tax professional as your goalie, goalies have an enormous amount of value on a soccer team in that they prevent the other team from making goals. However, you do not expect your goalie to make points. That's your striker. If you think of the strategy as the offense part of your team and your CPA as your defense part of the team, you sort of get the picture. We're the guys who come up with all the strategies that could potentially work. Your CPA, enrolled agent, tax professional should be the person who's creating the reports to justify what we've suggested. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jim, or I, is, I, and in addition to the guys, the women too. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that you went into that. And um, obviously, Jim Lorraine, I'm personally using you to, to help us build tax strategies, not only from a business, but a, on a personal standpoint, as well as you're assisting many of our clients in just being a more savvy investor, um, using real estate and many other avenues within and outside of real estate to allow them to reduce the amount of taxable income they are paying legally, right? These are written into the tax code and then use that money to then reinvest to grow their net worth more strategically. We're choosing this recording a little bit strategically right now. We're we're in a very special time. We're just coming up mid-April. I think we're going to try to release this on, on tax day this year. So it's very, uh, I, I think this is very important, hits home, but yeah. there's just so many strategies that people are unfamiliar with, yes. um, both real estate related and, and otherwise that I think is, is so important. And that point is, is so essential that you mentioned, Jim, Jim, about having the offensive and the defensive side, because many people assume, oh, my CPA should really be guiding me on this. Um, and they're a little frustrated when they, they go to their CPA and they haven't been you made aware of these certain strategies, but that's why it's important to employ a tax strategist and then also use a CPA in conjunction with that to make sure that we're doing everything right. appropriately and have it set up. So I love that idea. And this is, this has been you know paramount for us in our tax planning. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that are interested to speak with both of you to go through your planning. We'll mention this later and put it in the show notes. If anyone wants to schedule a, an individual tax analysis with both of you, just go to rentretirement.com forward slash tax, and they'll be able to go through some free information, have a tax analysis, and schedule some time with both of you. Well, let's go ahead and dive into it. We're going to go through kind of five main bullet points today that I think are high-level topics everyone should be aware of. The very first one being, what are just the main benefits of investing in real estate for, for a passive investor? Just anyone that buys real estate. You know, can you just give us a broad concept of what are some of those tax benefits anyone and everyone gets just from owning real estate? Real estate for us is fascinating. Lorraine and I have been real estate investors since 1993. And we were just talking before the show broadcast. We remember in 1993 dragging our little children to our first rental property and scraping the <laughs> wallpaper off of the wall. Okay. <laughs> We've been at this a long time, and we've learned from personal experience as well as professional some of the benefits of real estate. First, if you invest in real estate, you're investing in an asset class that has a tendency to keep pace with inflation. It grows. And right now, inflation, as of the end of March, is at 8.3%. Yikes. The second crazy. thing that Absolutely. we yeah. know about real estate is we want our real estate to produce rental income, right? Cash flow. And here's the brilliant thing about rental income from real estate. 
it is offset by a thing the IRS defines as depreciation. And let me define depreciation for a minute. If anybody's been a real estate investor for a while, you know carpet doesn't last 27 and a half years. <laughs> Although right. we've seen properties where the people thought the carpet lasted for 27 and a half years. <laughs> The IRS actually allows those things to be depreciated or expensed against rent. So when you buy a piece of real estate, you have depreciation. It offsets your rent. Now, for the average Joe, without any special approaches, no real estate professional status, none of that stuff, your rent is offset by depreciation, making your rent, to the extent you have that expense, tax-free. Tax -free. Wait a minute. Can you say that again? Tax free. I love it when she talks <laughs> like that. I just do. I mean, All that right? means in theory, if you had three thousand dollars of annual income through uh, through rent, that could be equivalent of you know five or potentially depending on your tax bracket, you know six thousand dollars in some places of the country um, that you that would otherwise be subject to. I mean, we have depreciation, and then we have all sorts of other expenses and write offs. Just the average person gets as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that's really cool about real estate is it goes up in value. But you'll notice you don't pay tax annually on the increase in value of your real estate. That's called deferred tax. So you only pay that tax when you sell the real estate later on. Unless you do a 1031. Right. So, right. yeah. So we'll talk about so that. So it is tax free income, right? At tax deferral on the growth. And then depending, and Jim said something um, interesting. He said professional real estate status, which we could go into later. To simplify that, real estate is passive. It's a passive investment. For most people who are W-2, working full-time, it is passive. So there are some limitations. Now, We'll talk later about RE Pro status, and that is having the real estate active. So, so active is you're physically working in the business like you would work in any other business. And in that case, your deductions are unlimited. And you can actually write that off against your, your active income if you have income yes. or have a spouse that has income. I mean, uh, that's, that's one of the other bullet points that we're going to get through. So, But just in general... You know, John Doe buys his first rental property. Fantastic. He gets tax-free income. He gets depreciation off, offset the active income. Um, other things he can write off, his, his mortgage interest, right? On, that's on his 1098T, right. I believe it is. Um, what about tax and insurance? What about closing costs yes. for that? What about setting Absolutely. up that LLC? What mm -hmm. about your management expense? I mean, all those things are also deductions, right? So you should be, in my opinion reporting a loss in a lot of cases on, on these properties, even though they're producing active income. Would you agree? Now you're getting technical. That's what you that can does. literally have losses on your real estate, even though you are making positive cash flow with your real estate. Okay. So we want to know, we want you to know that when we're talking losses, these are paper losses, not actual honest to God out of your pocket losses. If you're buying the right real estate, you know, Which you things, are with rent to reward, rent retire. to retirement. <laughs> now, one of the things that you said is writing a whole bunch of stuff off. One of the my favorite little techniques. Imagine for a minute that you buy a couple of pieces of real estate and you've got nice rental income coming through there, and you love your children and you want to save money for your children's college. Your real estate operation can pay your kids on payroll. Because they have payroll, they can then qualify for a Roth IRA, mind-blowing, available tax-free, available for higher education, tax-deductible for mom and dad against those rents, right? And tax-free income for the kids, up to $12,000. Specifically, because it's a Schedule E activity, in other words, it's a disregarded entity if you own your LLCs and such, Specifically, there's no self-employment tax for the children. The IRS knows all about this. They want you to put your kids on payroll. So I think <laughs> that's something that just sparks a lot of people's interest. But let's try it without. Uh, and that's the goal of today. Today, we're going to cover, cover a lot of high-level topics that we will be breaking down on future shows in more greater detail. Um, and obviously, if people are interested to go through their individual 
plan with each of you, they would schedule the time to do that. Right. Um, but I mean, Adam has 11 children and I think he's very interested <laughs> in, in setting this up. This is going to be paramount for him. Can we just talk a little bit more in greater detail about doing, doing that? Are we talking about child labor where the kids are going to be managing the properties? Right. Let's talk more about Let that. Answer that. So what we do in, in the implementation process. So let's say we're sitting down with somebody and let's say, Adam, we're 11 saying, children. okay, 11 children. Okay. What's their ages? What, what job description do they have? You have to have a job description and what are the hours and what is the pay? So people ask us a lot of times, well, I have, you know, a little baby. So maybe they, their baby is Johnny. So they, maybe they name their business Johnny properties and they take a picture or they take a family picture with their kids. You see it all the time with dentists, uh, uh, law firms, family law. You see the pictures of the entire family. Well, they're paying their, their family, their kids for that uh, marketing. And so that might be, you know, 6,000, 8,000, whatever the market rate is in that area. And then that child gets that income and that is 100% deductible against the real estate business, the LLC. And then the child has zero tax on that. So what are the actual, I mean, that's obviously something you could do with your kids, but if I actually wanted my kids to work in the business, what am I allowed to have them do now? If I have, you know, not if, so I have property managers. I only have four kids. Thank you very much, Zach. Uh, but, you <laughs> it know, just feels like there's 11 of them. <laughs> it definitely can. So, you know, let, I've got two seven-year-olds, a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old. What kind of actual work and am I allowed to say, like Zach said, I don't want to run into child labor laws, so I don't, I'm right. not going to have them like going out. I have property managers. My properties are far away. What can I actually have them do? Okay. Well, we have to understand that the job description from a tax perspective, the job description has to be something they're capable of doing. One of my favorite stories, I had a grandma and grandpa and they hired their five-year-old adorable grandson to do shredding, like, you know, take papers and put it in the shredder. Well, at five years old, he was fascinated by this. He kept putting the paper in the shredder and he did a great job of shredding until after he ran out of everything to shred he started to get creative to trying to find other things to shred. Grandma and grandpa are like, no, no, no. <laughs> as long as they're capable of doing the job, they're okay. So kids, as far as child yeah. labor laws are concerned, there's federal laws and state laws. That's not our expertise. However, if you think part-time work, the IRS, pretty much everybody's going to leave you alone. So it might be something where a seven-year-old may... They're, they're, kids nowadays, they're, they're amazing on the internet. They may want to um, look at properties. You could teach them how to analyze the properties. You can, um, you know, have them throw the trash. You can have them do different chores. Tours. What, what would you hire somebody else to do? It's like, what would you hire somebody else to do? So what we do is we have actual package forms. So in the forms, we have an employment agreement for the child that we provide. We auction, we have a um, list of hours. What is the job description? What is the hours? So we go into more depth and understanding your business model and the age of your children. What is natural? What would they, what, what do they actually do? Yeah. So that's, quite I mean, frankly, uh, child labor laws are designed to prevent you from requiring your 12 year old to work, you know, 15 hours in, in the coal mine. OK, not five hours a week in your office. So let's keep the, let's keep a per, some perspective on this. Mm -hmm. There is one final benefit of putting your children on payroll. If they misbehave, you can threaten to lay them off. <laughs> So those are, I mean, I love that stuff. It's very unique. Obviously, maybe this makes sense for some people, especially for those of us that, yeah, actually want to teach our children a little bit of the business side as they, you know, mm -hmm. are coming into those ages where it's important to kind of see that. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the, the passive tax benefits, uh, potentially individualistic. Obviously, each person can explore this with you. Um, just a quick side note on 529's college savings plan. Is that is that possible to set up real estate within that? Or is that... Uh, opening up a, a can of worms here. Okay. 529 plans. 
Uh, they're great for uh, grandmas and grandpas who don't necessarily trust the other spouse, if you get my drift. 529 plans are specifically deducted from your children's need when they go to qualify for Pell Grant student loans and what have you. Depending on the state, they can be tax deductible or, or not. Most states, they're not tax deductible. The contribution into a 529 plan. They are tax deferred. However, if you do not use the money for higher education, it comes back to mom and dad with a 10% tax penalty. We're, Maybe we're, better just okay. to set it up in the real estate and let the normal tax benefits you get, you know, be to your advantage and use that potentially for college versus dedicating it to 529 per se. We, we love Roth IRAs. Sure. Because Roth IRAs grow tax-free. You don't have to use it for college education, although you can. And, and um, you can go self-directed and buy real estate in a Roth IRA. I mean, teaching the kids, one of the greatest benefits a parent can have to their children is teaching them how to fish, teaching them the real estate business. Of and so now they put their kids on payroll. The kids get excited. They see their statement from their Roth. Uh, they could, you know, partner up with the parent, buy the real estate. And they're, it's such an incredible education above and beyond the tax benefits. And that's the big picture, ultimately, is we're cr trying to create generational wealth and using those tax advantages to pass on. I mean, we're, we're passing on the education. Uh, oh, yeah. And that's that's the most valuable thing. So I guess, and, yeah, Adam, you got to put yeah. your kids to work, right? Is a long story <laughs> yeah, short. All here. eleven of them, Adam. All and eleven. The <laughs> one thing that I do want to say about the Roth is that it is not deducted on your FAFSA application, like the five twenty nine is. So it's yeah. excluded. So you you can you know if you the kids get a scholarship and they've got you know fifty thousand dollars. First, you have to use the 529 first in the Roth. You don't, it's excluded. You can get the full scholarship and have the Roth either use it for higher education or defer it to re retirement. I, I got to say, there's something really exciting about this. You notice that we started talking about the benefits of real estate. You notice how quickly expanded, like well into now we're doing college planning. And, I mean, it's like for me, real estate's like the Swiss Army knife of financial in, in the financial world. There's so much you can do with this stuff. Okay? And that wasn't even one of our bullet points. Jim. So go ahead. I do want to ask one more thing about uh, the tax benefits. Let's say I'm not, you know, I don't have a tax uh, plan with y'all or anything right now, but I do have a CPA who did my taxes for this year. And I'm looking over it to make sure that it's what I want to submit to the IRS for my taxes. What are some things that people should really look at to make sure that their CPA has properly deducted everything in your opinion? Well, most of the time, what the taxpayer can be responsible for is, is it accurate? Are the numbers actually there and are they actually the right numbers? All the time we see tax returns where the tax advisor decided to take a shortcut and write up $40,000 on whatever it is. And the taxpayer is like, wait a minute, I only spent $32,000. That kind of thing the taxpayer is actually responsible for. However, when it comes to deductions, sometimes it's very difficult to read that. So what you really want to do is you want to take your tax return, go ahead, take advantage of the tax evaluation that we're offering to the rent to retirement community, submit your tax return. Our software program will read it over and we will able we will be able to tell you what you should have been able to deduct and what you will be able to deduct next year. An evaluation. And the biggest thing there is just having proper planning. I, I think, you know, I, Adam was asking about like right, right now, and that's important to, to look at yes. that. But moving forward, it's, it's having that offensive planning as, as well as a defensive side and just educating yourself and making sure you're, you're having the right professionals assist you with this. Yeah, we um, only have a few days left before the 18th unless somebody wants to do an extension, Adam, to 
go back yep. to 2021, most of the strategies, the guillotine comes down on December 31st. Okay. Yep. So like putting your kids on payroll, Augusta roll, certain things like that, uh, that is, has to be done by December 31st. Uh, things that could be done after the fact or like cost seg, Roth or IRA contributions up until April, up you know, eight, eight, yeah, well, no, April 18th. Um, and so what happens is, is that there may be a few things to look at. One of the things that we find, especially when people do their own tax returns, is the depreciation schedule is not accurate. We see that a lot. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of one of the big things that we see. And here's a favorite one for real estate investors. This mistake is made all the time. And it's very common when people tr change tax preparers. Depreciation gets left off the report entirely. Now, let me explain the danger of that. The danger of that, obviously, is you miss tax deductions today. However, when you go to sell the property, IRS doesn't care whether you used it or not. They recapture the amount you mm -hmm. should have used. It can be a very expensive hmm. mistake. That's that's detrimental, um, you know, and, and obviously furthers the point that you got to be hiring the right people and, and not be trying to, you know, save a couple bucks on your preparation, um, because obviously the, the right people in the place will allow will save you significantly more money than they're going to cost you in, in the short and long term. So we talked a little bit about other people's money prior to the show here. So. How is, how is that being creative to, in, in the tax realm, um, investing with other people's money? Oh, okay. One of our favorite topics, OPM, other people's money, <laughs> is we like to educate and coach people on the opportunities of having uh, B locks and P locks and S locks and HELOCs. So let me go through that. A B-lock is a business line of credit when you have a business or maybe even a side business. So credit unions have the lowest rate, although we've seen some banks that have, you know, had three, four percent interest. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to get a line of credit to start your real estate purchase. And so a business line of credit is an opportunity. A P-lock is a personal line of credit. And an S-lock is a secured line of credit. So putting $20,000 in, in an account and then um, collateralizing against that. And then, of course, we love the HELOC, the home equity line of credit. When you use a HELOC to invest to invest, period, then the interest is deductible on a HELOC. So that's really important because that's an additional deduction. And so one of the things we like to do is use OPM, buy the real estate, get the real estate going, and then use the passive income and the tax savings to pay down the uh, OPM, the, the other people's money, the, the, the lines of credit, you pay it down and then you repeat. When you pay it down, you repeat, you buy another property, you pay it down faster and you repeat. And eventually what happens is your income is replaced by your assets. I love that. And that's yeah. really the, the idea is, is you, you have this, you're borrowing other people's money, not only for the line of credit in one of these many factors, which then the interest of that is a, is a tax write-off. Um, you're potentially yes. leveraging the, the majority of that with a bank just to acquire real estate, which has its own tax deductions, which can be yes. compounded to that. And then through the cash flow, our tax-free cash flow, we're paying that money back. And then we can snowball that up and transition it up, right? And kind of rinse and repeat. So, I mean, that, that's kind of high level, but just on the, that was one of our bullet points. So obviously there's, there's a lot to dive into a potential, uh, you know, ways to strategize and set that up, but kind of high level OPM, great way to maximize your tax benefits from multiple strategies. Anything else to add on OPM? Yes. Think about this for just a minute. You do not pay tax on money that you borrow. 
whether it's from your house, from your mom and dad, from your line of credit, anything, it's tax-free money. So if you're borrowing money (laughs) tax-free and you're buying a tax-efficient asset like real estate, aren't you double-dipping on the IRS? (laughs) I'm telling you, it feels really good. It really does. Just trust me on that. It's like, Yeah. And when we get to it, one of the things that you'll hear us talk about is the tax deductions that are available on real estate. Imagine borrowing money tax free and buying assets that create tax deductions. Like what? Now you're really doing a triple ended deal on the IRS and it's legal center street with the IRS. Mm -hmm. The only thing they were very picky about is how you report this stuff. That's it. Yeah, you it. mentioned the interest is, you know, deductible on your HELOC. Is it still deductible on the the PLOC and the SLOC as well, or is that a different story? It is still deductible. Okay. That's you just know the difference is where you report it. You used to use the HELOCs and these things on the Schedule A. That's been eliminated, but because you're using it for real estate, we move it over to a Schedule E, like Edward. Right. It's it's how it's being reported that creates the difference in how you're using the money. Like if you go use the money to go buy, I don't know, a car or Ferraris are still not tax deductible. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm you know, you just go and spend the money and go on a vacation. Right. That's not going to be deductible. Yeah, kind of. I mean, with with all this compounding effect, it's like, should real estate investors really be paying any taxes if they're strategically, you know, setting up their plan? I, I don't know. Maybe in not. fact, a matter. This is a common problem that we run into. Mm-hmm. How much tax should you pay? If you pay no income tax at all, which is possible, the problem that you're going to have is qualifying for cell phones and car loans and things like that. <laughs> So broke. there's this <laughs> magic balance point that we're going to reach. And each person's balance point is different from other people. Okay. And there is, I mean, and banks do understand this on the high level because you have your business income. You know, banks will understand if you're trying to finance for loans. I mean, maybe not on your Fannie Mae so much, but kind of a high level business. Like we've been buying real estate for many, many years. We use all these strategies to reduce our taxable income from a reporting standpoint. Um, But banks understand that that's never prevented us from being able. And obviously we have the liquidity to put as a down payment, but we can justify that in just going through these strategies and reporting that. We touched on this a lot. This is one of my favorite things to to run through. And one of our our main strategies we personally use is uh, cost segregation studies. Using that through real estate (laughs) professional status. I think this is something a lot of people have interest in because we've talked about it a lot or they've researched it. But let's talk a little bit about first, what is real estate professional status? What are kind of the bullet points to qualify for that? And and how can you take real estate and other things to go through and write off additional streams of income, particularly with the cost segregation study? Let's use Lorraine and I for just a moment. Let's assume that Lorraine is making a half a million dollars running our tax firm. That's not real estate. Okay, if I'm a real estate investor and I'm a full time real estate investor, I have to spend 51 percent of my time investing, managing and or and I'll get to this in a minute and or working real estate. I have to have material participation. I also have to prove 750 hours for the year. One works out to about 15 hours a week of doing Development or redevelopment, construct or reconstruct, acquire, convert, rent or lease, operate or manage, or brokering real estate. Now, what I did was I just read exactly what the code says. And if you want a little more definition, we are offering a resource that gives you a little bit more definition of what the code says. So just know that when you come in for evaluation, you can get a resource that talks about real estate professional status. And Jim, just real quick to stop you, I think add, an, add another point um, to ask about as well, but this is not something you're actually applying for, right? This is not an application. I mean, if you go into your CPA and say, do I qualify, qualify for real estate professional status? I mean, they may not be able to guide you, right? It's, it's more or less, here's, here's the criteria and you tell me, do you meet this criteria? That's so it's correct. important to know Am, am I able to justify this? So when we're saying qualify for real estate professional status, 
really what it boils down to is would you would you meet all these criteria in the sense that the or in the event that the IRS were to ask you to justify this um, in yes. an audit or something like this? Really, right? And the yes. IRS does require you to keep a log of your time to be able to prove your time. Yeah, and what I was going to add, uh, Zach, is that it is not an application. It yeah. is not licensing. Yeah. So it is activity. Remember, we talked about real estate being passive uh, for those W-2 people who are full-time, and now we're changing to real estate being active. An active business is like, okay, you're opening up, um, you know, and you're selling a product or service. That's an active business. So now we're making real estate active. So the IRS says a minimum of 750 hours plus. But we have, what we have found is the IRS will go through the log and they will say, no, we're going to disqualify these hours and these hours and these hours. So you really in real life, you really want to have more like 1300, 1400 hours in real estate and log it. Yeah. Anytime you touch real estate mm -hmm. should pretty much qualify as material participation, physically contacting the real estate, physically seeing the real estate. Going to uh, trips, looking at the real estate, visiting their properties. What about research online, them? though? What about running numbers? Oh, That's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It all depends on which one of these categories you're having. And what yes. we're suggesting is uh, a couple of things. First, I love things that are easy. At the end of each year, you contact your cell phone company and you get a bill and they'll literally give you time stamped how much time you spent on different phone calls. And for instance, if you're dealing with Adam or Zach on a regular basis, you find their phone number and you highlight it and there you go. If you're contacting us, there's no way you're having a conversation with us and not talking about real estate. You highlight that phone number. So that's one resource to help you prove your 750 hours. The second part is any kind of an Excel spreadsheet or even a grocery bag with times listed on the back of it. I literally saw a client who did that. Okay. <laughs> so the IRS does not require how the report works or looks. They just require a certain amount of information. And that is time, activity, address associated. Those are the three basic And components. do you want to talk about real estate agent, real estate broker? Oh, I love this one. Zach, funny, funny, funny thing. The IRS does not consider real estate agents, real estate professionals. Now, for me, I've always thought that was hysterics. Being a real estate investor, you know that sometimes it's difficult to find a real estate agent who actually knows, right? <laughs> real estate broker, if you are a real estate broker, any of your brokerage activities can be added for real estate professional status, okay? That's the only licensure commentary that they have in the tax code. Beyond that, it's all about the activities. And you, But you don't need any sort of licensure in, in reality. That is you correct. You can be inactive. No okay. license required at all. Yep. In fact, a matter that was one of the conversations we had early on. If you're licensed, you got to tell the people you're doing business with, oh, I have a real estate license. Okay. If you're not licensed, you don't have to tell them that you have 300 hours of, of expertise this year alone, much less the thousands and thousands of hours of experience in the past. Of course. So we kind of like the idea of just like taking and, RE pro status. And it's so simple on the tax return, you know, where it says on the first page, your occupation, <clears throat> where it says your occupation, it's RE pro. It's just right. occupation, RE pro. I yep. love it. Yeah. And that's what we've titled the resource, RE Pro. <laughs> now, quick comment. Let's sew some of the buttons together that we've talked about. <laughs> okay. First, buying real estate is very tax efficient. I think we all understand that. Second, you can put your kids on payroll. We talked about that. Third, we talked about you can borrow money tax free to buy real estate. Here's the fun part. Let's assume for a second, Adam, I'm going to pick on you and your 11 children. Okay. <laughs> Imagine for a minute, Adam, that you borrow money to go buy real estate. You get the money tax-free that you put into the real estate. You buy enough real estate that you can get 
accelerated depreciation, the cost segregation, real estate professional status, the whole nine yards. So now you're getting tax deductions against any and all forms of income, interest income, rental income, earned income like W-2 jobs. Maybe your wife is a nurse or something of that nature. She better have some experience with 11 kids. Okay. <laughs> the point is you're now getting tax-free money to put into a tax deductible asset that's growing tax deferred and is producing cash flow tax-free. It's <laughs> a lot of tax. <laughs> yeah. It's mind blowing. And if you put, here's the fun part. I, I'm a nerd. I'm sorry. I have to admit this. I actually have a collection of calculators. Okay. When you actually calculate out the ROI and include the tax savings, it's significant, truly significant return on investment versus anything else I know of that you can invest in. The hard thing is just calculating it, right? Is, is first of all, you got to understand this stuff and you got to run through and then you have to apply it and then and then you have to track it and actually run those numbers. So when you look at this side of the house and Adam knows when you really do a deep dive and I only am touching the surface with some of these things, but already that tax benefit has been significant for us um, in, in our business. I mean that, yes, ROI skyrockets. And then you and then you can couple that with, OK, this is money that you would have otherwise given Uncle Sam, but then you can go out and reinvest that and then yield a return on that. I mean, it's just endless. It's endless and endless. And that's how, I mean, that is truly how the wealthy build generational wealth and compound and preserve and protect their wealth over time is you have to be actively engaged and be doing this type of stuff. Uh, and people give me a hard time because we run depreciation, just normal depreciation in our ROI or debt or debt reduction. Right. And it's like, man, if you really knew the, the intricate details of, of how significant this is, um, this is a stuff where you really cash flow is important. Cash flow is not the most important thing investing in real estate. It's really applying these type of concepts long term. And stacker stacking them and layering them. And one of the things Jim and I are passionate about is educating people and letting them know that these strategies are out there because it is a myth that you have to be wealthy in order to use these strategies. Anybody can use these strategies and supercharge their wealth. Yeah, there are three tax benefits for just owning real estate without real estate professional, any of this other stuff. And that is tax deferred growth, tax free income, and the tax free pay down of your mortgage. That happens tax free. So we talked a little bit about, uh, and Adam, cut me off here if you uh, you have some things you want to jump into. I just want to kind of make the transition to, okay, we talked about real estate professional status, but really the big benefit with that is taking passive losses and applying it to active income. This could mean someone that's an attorney, doctor, lawyer, engineer, if they have a wife that or a spouse or a husband that's doing real estate related activities and applying that. I mean, and they're an active investor that can be applied to take those passive yeah. losses against the active income and specifically cost segregation study. I think we've touched on this enough in our previous episodes, but let's just talk about really what that is and how we define that real quick, if you don't mind, Lorraine, Jim. I'm dealing with a, a, a very successful young man. He lives in the Kansas City area and he has friends who are investing successfully in real estate. And he said he wanted to go invest in real estate. So our team put him in touch with me and he said, well, why do I need tax strategy? All I want to do is spend money on real estate and go buy real estate because I, I, it's a really cool investment. And I said, well, let's go through the strategies and let's see what happens. I found out his wife works for his company, meaning she could decide to not work for his company and it wouldn't <laughs> affect their income. OK, <laughs> and it's a very rare opportunity for a husband to be able to say to his wife, you're fired. Okay? You're fired and you're welcome. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Once we were done with that, we were able to establish that she could take real estate professional status. Lo and behold, we saved them. I'm not kidding you. $175,000 in tax. $175,000. It does not take a rocket scientist to figure out that that's a chunk of money for a down payment, courtesy of the IRS. I think whenever, you know, talking to people daily about this, as they want to kind of achieve their financial freedom, it's something that you should always be looking at is, you know, let's just talk about maybe replacing 
one income and getting you out of your job so that we can, mm -hmm. you know, work on getting yeah. you the status so that now we're offsetting my active income. And it's just a strategy that everybody can employ, like you were talking about. Yes. And it should definitely be something you're thinking about. Like, there's no need to maybe think about replacing a little bit of mine and a little bit of my wife's. Why not just focus on one, yes. get them off? Because, you know, you can't really be, I don't think based on what I've read, you can't be a real estate professional if you still have a full-time job. It's impossible right. according to the IRS. Right. Yeah. So There are many cases where people have lost that argument with the IRS. Here's an interesting comment. We have gone through this process with many people. And I have a intelligence officer and a nuclear engineer as a married couple. And the goal was to get the nuclear engineer wife free from her W-2 job. We got close to it. We showed them how the math worked. We realized that she did not have to work. And I asked her, do you want to still work? And she said, actually, I do. So here's the theory. The theory is not freedom from work, but freedom of work. She now gets to go to work every day, and she knows the minute it's not a place she wants to be, she can say, bye, changes the work in environment, doesn't it? I mean, that's really what it boils down to. That's, I mean, that's big picture here, of course, absolutely. Real estate itself can become a full-time job that you don't always enjoy, you know what I mean? But if you're setting it up appropriately, uh, it, it's about having that, that flexibility and, and that income that's still being produced, whether you're actively working or not. Just a real quick uh, touch on the cost segregation so we can move along to our other uh, bullet points. Basically, what a cost segregation is, is accelerated depreciation, where you are taking that um, a portion of that property, um, the value of it loss in, against the first year that year. Um, and this could vary. I mean, I've seen people in mobile home parks take upwards of 80%. That's just crazy of the value. Some, and you can take cost segregation studies um, on single family. Uh, some people will assume that you cannot, but you absolutely can. If you have a $100,000 property and you get a 30% deduction in year one, that would be equivalent to a $30,000 $30, deduction. Now, real estate professional status is allowing you to take that, that against your active income you don't actually need to be a real estate professional to do a cost segregation study, but that is where you're actually taking that against active income. Did I state that appropriately? Anything to correct, Jim and Lorraine? Yeah. So what happens is there is some details and some rules. So it's based on adjusted gross income. So if a couple or a single person, doesn't matter if it's joint filing or single, it's $100,000 of adjusted gross income. Somebody can take a cost segregation and go negative up to $25,000. So that would bring their income from 100 down to 75. That's with, without real estate professional status. Without, without, real, without real estate professional status. Yeah. And then if it, their income's 125,000, it's about 12,000 negative, 150,000 AGI and up then the deduction on whether it's cost segregation or expenses or whatever is limited to the amount of positive cash flow. Right. So then at that point, it's like, okay, how can we get one spouse to qualify for RE Pro? Does that make sense? Or what are, we, what are the strategies that we can utilize? Well, this is paramount. Let me just restate what you're saying real quick for everyone to make sure we captured that. If you, if your adjusted gross income combined is below $150,000 without real estate professional status, you can be taking your passive losses against your active income to go, to go negative. And it's, it's limit, you know, it's, it's depending at where your adjusted gross income is at a hundred thousand dollars and less it's a $25,000 deficit phased out at $150,000. Mm -hmm. Once you really real estate professional is talking about those individuals above that $150,000 taking those active. So most people should be considering taking those additional losses on their, their real estate. So <laughs> I, I love that. Um, yes. Really yes. So, well, so many people miss that. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, they missed it. However, Adam, you asked a great question. What about last year? So you, even though last year is over, you can still 
get a cost segregation up to your filing. So extensions are uh, October 15th. So you can still get that done. It just needs to be a property that was in service before you owned it before the end of last year. And you can you also do cost segregation yeah. on pop properties you bought a while ago, right? It doesn't have to be bought in the year preceding necessarily. Correct. Okay. Generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, if the property is within three years of its purchase date, cost seg works really well. Certain circumstances, you can expand that considerably depending on the property and the circumstances. But yes. Or capital improvements. And capital improvement. That's another good one. Okay. Yeah. So if but, our listeners want to go back and see and hear Zach completely nerd out about cost segs, let's go back into our archives. <laughs> and uh, search cost segregation. We did a, a whole episode with the cost seg specialist. And yeah. I think it was about 45 minutes long where they went down uh, down a rabbit hole because when you get Zach talking about taxes and cost segregations, you've uh, you've got a good conversation going. So uh, I love that stuff. And that's Steve Tressel because yeah. he's he's a guy that I personally use to do ours. <laughs> um, it's uh, cost segregation is having an engineer go through and actually give a detailed yes. report of what things you can take accelerated depreciation on because obviously not everything in the building is going to last for the full depreciation on we buy a lot of commercial assets which we typically see in um you know we reduce the land out of it but uh typically we're seeing between a 30 to 40 percent depreciation in year one meaning you buy a million dollar building that could be a three to four hundred thousand dollar if that's all you know improvements not including land that could be a three to four hundred thousand dollar deduction in that first year you still get normal depreciation year after year following that. Um, but that's just allowing you to be more creative to not have to pay that money to Uncle Sam in year one and then go out and reinvest it in other stuff. Okay, let's talk about capital gains. We got we hang on hang on here, people, because we yeah, still got some you. very essential stuff that is going <laughs> to save you a ton of money in taxes. If you have to go back and listen to this and take notes, please do. Again, rentretirement.com forward slash tax is where you can reach out to Lorraine and Jim to actually set up a a, a consultation with them. They're doing an analysis. They typically charge $500 for the average individual. They're doing it for any rent retirement clients for 97. That's just an initial analysis to kind of give you a big picture and then decide if you want to proceed with them to go further into your, your tax strategies. So let's talk capital gains. Capital gains tax. It is a lower tax than your average earned income tax. So one of the basic strategies is to do the math and consider actually paying the tax because sometimes that's the most efficient thing to do and typically that's 15 to 20 percent right and not including state 20 to 23 percent depending because of the obamacare tax yeah okay now state by state some states recognize capital gains most states do not most states and particularly in the state of california consider it earned income so we have to be very cognizant of your state implications, not just your Fed, right? So knowing that, what can we do about capital gains tax? As my daddy said, if somebody's willing to write you a big, fat, stupid check, maybe you should ought to cash it, okay? <laughs> That's first and foremost. Capital gains tax should never stop you from selling a property. What it should do is cause you to get in touch with somebody like ourselves so we can walk through how to mitigate, offset, defer, or even eliminate the tax. There's several different techniques, and I'm just going to give you a couple of quick highlights. Number one, you can offset the tax. This is very common, particularly if you've already cashed the check and the sale is mm -hmm. already done. Now we're looking for offsets. For instance, the cost segregation. Now, here's an interesting one. Imagine I borrow money, OPM, go buy a property, get that property, do an accelerated depreciation, a cost seg study on that property, don't I get a tax deduction with tax-free money? I love it. It's like, it's mind boggling. And cost segregation is ordinary. This is, gets a little weird. It's ordinary income. It's more powerful than the capital gains tax because capital gains tax is at a lower rate than your ordinary income. So we can leverage it. You don't have to have a dollar for dollar offset in order to get to a zero tax is the bottom line. So just to just add to that is what Jim's talking about is there's a property that's sold by doing a cost seg on another property that they own. 
not the property that was sold. Yeah. Right. Important differentiation there. Yep. Can you, and obviously with cost segregation, I mean, if you sell that property, that depreciation you took is recapturable to a yes. certain degree, Correct. but you can 1031 that again, right? Yes. Okay. You can 1031 exchange out. Um, you can reverse 1031 exchange. In other words, you can buy the property first, sell your property, and then exchange. Mm -hmm. You can do a straight 1031 exchange, sell your property, and then buy your upleg properties. Okay. Partial 1031 exchanges. A little bit of a warning. The way the math works is not straightforward. You will end up paying more tax on a partial 1031 exchange than you would think. In other words, if I did half, you would think I'm half the tax. It doesn't work that way. Whatever's it's remaining, right? So if you had, let's say you needed, you sold a property for 700, you need to buy 700, you only bought 600. So that $100,000 is fully exposed in, in taxable right. amount, right? So yep. um, that's why it's important. When we're working with our clients on doing a 1031, we make sure, okay, we got a little bit of buffer room. So we're not identifying just 700,000. We're also being conscious of the 200% rule. So you're not having to, you know, close on basically all of those and put yourself in a bad position, but there's a balancing act. Yeah. Correct. That could be a whole session on 1031 exchange because the way that it works is it's, it's, it's almost like not fair. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh, okay. So I had somebody who was going to pull out a hundred thousand dollars on a 1031 and it ended up being as if they weren't doing a 1031 on, on the rest of the half a million dollar property yep. because the way that the IRS runs the math. So well, with, like with all these things, it's just very intricate. You need to make sure that you have the right people in place. I mean, the, the ideas are great, but the implementation, you need to have the right people that are assisting you. You, with, you need to yep. get a, a, an assessment done, a, a tax projection, uh, one of the things I would say to all the listeners is if you are considering and thinking about selling or have sold a property or planning on selling to get a analysis done on what is the yeah. tax, whether from your current accountant or from somebody, it could even be us to get that assessment because after the pa after the fact, people are like, oh my gosh, what happened? They you didn't don't know expect. What you don't know. Yeah, they didn't know. know that there was recaptured all that yeah. wonderful deductions that they had. They had to pay it back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and they didn't know. So going back to capital gains. There are certain types of trusts that can defer capital gains tax. If your sale is significant enough, they certainly make sense to do that. What that allows you to do, sell your asset, use this trust, defer the tax, invest part of the money any of which way you want to pretty much. And then at spread the tax out so you can offset it much more easily, like with your ongoing real estate operations. There's also charitable trusts that can act in the same fashion where you get a tax deferral on the actual sale and only pay tax on the income. There's also charitable trusts where you can use the charitable trust to offset the tax. And these so, are things that are not required. We're, we're not talking about those that are real estate professionals. This has nothing to do with this is just in general, you, you set up the correct. trust appropriately. Uh, but maybe we could solidify that with a little kind of a numeric example, if we don't mind. Sure. So let's assume for a second, I have a half a million dollars of capital gains. I bought the property for 50 grand. Somebody came along and offered me 550,000 for the property. Okay, great. I want to sell it. I set up one of these trusts. The trust itself is tax exempt. So there is no, there's no tax on the sale. We complete the sale. Now the money sits inside the trust. And the only thing that's taxable out of the trust is whatever income I pull out of the trust. Does that make sense? That would be a potential. So, I mean, basically that's another option beyond doing a 1031. You can do a 1031 if you want to yep. leverage up and buy more real estate. This is just another option. Um, yeah. that you could potentially explore. Let's talk a little bit more about CLT or CLAT, ACLAT, the Charitable Lead Authority Trust. This is another thing that was kind of yeah. mind-blowing to me the first time we had this discussion because this is a way that <laughs> anyone can buy real estate, you know, donate to charity. For If someone is donating to charity already, this is something that it just makes it way more beneficial for their own tax benefit. 
And often when people do, you know, create generational wealth through real estate, yeah. they, they set up these type of things. Absolutely. But, but so Jim and this. I, yeah, we, we have always supported charity in our church. <laughs> and, and so we got certified in charitable planning back in 2001. And we love these strategies. They're, they're, they're center stream with the IRS. They've been codified in the code for, um, gosh, since the 19, 60s. 1969. 1969. And so uh, just the concept. The concept is you buy a piece of real estate. Let's say that real estate has $100,000 of equity. So it doesn't matter if it has a mortgage on it or if you bought it free and clear. It's $100,000 equity. When you take that property and you transfer it, quick claim it to a charitable trust, you get a hundred thousand dollar tax deduction. And you're like, what? How how am I getting a tax deduction? I'm I'm just transferring title to this charitable trust. The reason why you get a hundred thousand dollar deduction is because you are making a promise to give those rents to charity over the next 15 years, 17 years, that will equal $100,000. So just to keep math simple, let's say the net rents is $10,000. So you give $10,000 and in 10 years, that's $100,000 plus interest. So it might go another two years. So that'd be 12 years. And at the end of the 12 years, the trust has given away 120,000. It's fulfilled its obligation. And now the trust is dissolved and you get the house back. So Wait your family- Did you say you get it back? Yeah, you get it. So, so the family, <laughs> the family gets to retain the asset. You're never giving away the asset. You're giving away- future rents. So it's huge leverage. And right now the interest rates are still favorable. It still makes really good sense. I mean, the beautiful thing about this is yes, this is participation in charity. Um, but really this in, in my mind is to some degree retirement planning, because if you're not, if you don't say necessarily need, if you're a high income earner and you don't need to live off of that, that cash flow from that property, and you can pay it back at whatever length of time you really need to, or sooner or later, um, as long as you pay that back to the uh, to the trust or the promise and fulfill that IRS need. It, it allows you to take a huge tax deduction in year one, yes. but then also get that tax deduction and have that property be coming back to you once that um, payment to the charity is fulfilled. Charity is is a great thing to participate to, but you can also use this strategically as retirement planning where you can at some point when you do plan to have that be you're living off of that or pass it on to your family as a, a retirement picture, um, you can get that tax deduction in year one and be very strategic with that. I love that. Now, does the, you know, if you put it in the, the trusts and you're donating all the profits to it, I'm assuming you're still in control of the property. You're paying the mortgage, you're paying for any repairs, you're putting tenants in and all of that. You're not completely giving away like all control of the asset, or are you? In theory, you shouldn't be managing the property with inside, uh, inside of a charitable lead trust. That's considered self-dealing. Now, if you're like any of the other real estate investors I've ever dealt with, you hire a property manager and then manage the manager. That's okay, all right? Uh, the money that the trust earns sits inside the trust until you complete the promise to the charity then it all comes back out to you, the family. So to answer more detail, um, Adam, you as the donor are the trustee of the trust. Yes, so you're the boss. It's, so it's it's very similar to a uh, self-directed IRA, right? In a self-directed IRA, analogy. inside of that you know, circle there, the property's inside of there. So an IRA pays the mortgage. An IRA pays the property tax. Well, the trust pays the mortgage. The trust pays the property tax. You have a checking account. You're the trustee. You write mm -hmm. the checks. Yep. You you write the checks for yep. the property tax, the insurance, or you people have auto debit for the mortgage. So it all comes out of that trust. 
Did, so, did that um, make sense to you? Yeah, and, but what happens, just out of curiosity, let's say seven years down the line, I think, you know, this property, it's time for it to go. I need to sell it because of one reason or another. How do, do you just on sale? Do you put the money back into the trust to pay it off? Or how does that part work? If I could. Yes. You can either do a 1031 exchange and keep the trust running. Or let's assume big fat stupid check syndrome. You paid a hundred thousand for the property. Somebody's offering you two hundred grand for it. You're seven years in, so you owe another five years worth of income or fifty grand. Great, sell the property, go to court, say, hey, I got the fifty thousand. I want to pay off the uh, the charity and call it quits to the game. Yep, no problem. So you're so, paying the difference, what's still owed potentially, or keeping to- it going. As long as you pay what's due to the charity, kind of like what you would do if it was a loan to a bank, as long as you pay to the charity what you promised the charity, that's really the critical function inside the trust. But other than that, yes, you can exchange the assets, improve the assets, uh, sell the assets, diversify, all of those good things. Now, here's a real fun one. I'm going to sew some of these pearls together that we talked about. I'm going to pick on the Adam that has 11 children for a minute. Okay, (laughs) Adam has 11 children. He sets up the real estate. He becomes a real estate professional so his wife can continue her W-2 job. She gets a great big bonus, and so they've got a tax problem. Adam thinks quickly, I know. I'm going to come after and get some tax deductions. He goes to look at his real estate. Somebody's offered to buy a piece of real estate, and it's a big, fat, stupid check. He can't say no. He sells it. He's got even more tax problems. No problem. Because what we can do, Adam, is we can borrow other people's money, use that to buy additional real estate, get a cost segregation report, and, oh, by the way, put it inside one of these charitable trusts. (laughs) Do we see what's going on so far? Do you remember the 11 children? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. By the way, if you've ever been in a room with four children and tried to count them, you'll get to 11 pretty easy. Okay. (laughs) Here's the point. There are so many tax tools available to us. I'm not much concerned about the tax this year. I'm more concerned about what's important to you and your family. Imagine sitting down with your kids and asking them, okay, kids, we have a charity. We have a promise to give money to charity. Which charity do we give the money to and why? And you ask your kids that. What are you doing? You're teaching them heart. Yes, you're giving them all the mechanical knowledge on how to invest and make money and all the rest of it. But now you're really training their heart. And that can make a huge difference in the future of this world, in my opinion. Save the tax. Keep the kids on payroll. Don't worry about the tax when you sell the assets because we'll figure that out. And now we can actually serve a greater good. Yeah, I was about to say you uh, you pay the kids for the meeting, right? <laughs> for the meeting, the meeting that you have about which which charity you pay them for that meeting, right? Oh yeah. If I they mean, have an actual charity, if you actually set up your own family foundation or, in fact, your own charity, yes, you can put your kids on payroll. Yeah, I think that's that's one thing that we talked, uh, you know, offline. We talked a little bit about when you were doing the uh, the donor advised fund. And actually having some allocation, I don't know. I would say that's beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today. But right. just real yeah. quick, I mean, in theory, you you could, right? I mean, you could set up yeah. your own family trust and actually mm-hmm. pull a wage off of that for someone that is truly managing that. That would be at the level where you were actually have a larger a larger trust yeah. that's compounding year after year. Um, but what this the point is is once you kind of open the door to these type of things, um, it's it's very exciting. And I think that's really ultimately what drives most people to invest in, in real estate big picture. I mean, we covered a lot of just pretty intense stuff today, which is also very exciting. I, I would hope for most people, yeah. or at least eye-opening to, hey, there's a better way to do things. There's, there's a little yes. bit more strategy that maybe I need to educate myself on, hire the right professionals and learn about it. If, if nothing else, just learn about it and then learn how to apply it. But ultimately, real estate investing at a high degree allows you to become financially literate, replace your income, become financially independent and create generational wealth and be contributing to society through these charitable efforts. I mean, those are all things that are outstanding. Most of us strive to achieve those. It takes time, right? It takes education. This isn't easy for most people, but it is surrounding yourself with the right people and taking those action steps. Educate yourself 
and apply all the strategies that we talked about today to some degree. So this is why I love this stuff. This is very exciting to me and the type of stuff that we're, we're doing actively with our family, with our children, with our business uh, year after year. And we, we encourage everyone to do the same. So is there any parting words on, on the tax side? I mean, obviously, I think this is something people should go back and listen to and learn about and obviously reach out, Lorraine and Jim, to you guys. It's rentretirement.com forward slash tax to get some information if they want to have that kind of initial analysis that you're offering at a you know 80% discount, I think, for $97 to rent retirement mm-hmm. clients. Um, but more importantly, to set up a time to actually go through an individual strategy with you guys. I mean, any final words as we're right around the corner from tax season that you'd like to uh, remind people about? Well, I would just say it's worth it to just get a quick initial analysis, I would say, or evaluation. I would say that probably 100% of the people are missing something. Could be small, could be big. We see it all the time. It just, it's, it's, I I don't know. I just can't express it enough because people don't know what they don't know. There's a lot of opportunities and it took us decades to learn everything that we've learned. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not like there's some course out there to teach you how to be a strategic thinker when it comes to tax. So yes, years and years of experience, years and years of training in various disciplines as you notice that our conversation is going all over the place it isn't just been about the 1040 or the schedule e yeah the bottom line is this get an evaluation know where you know where you're at that's so important because that can help you decide more effectively what you want to do in the future okay make sure you involve your children they need to learn this stuff this is not just for the adults to play Okay, that's for you, Adam, all 11 of them. Okay, and the bottom line is this we're very excited to work with you. We're so happy that we can bring value to your investors to help them grow their real estate portfolio even more. Well, thank you all so much, Jim and Lorraine, for coming on the show with us today. Once again, Jim and Lorraine are tax strategists for real estate investors. And are offering a free two-page resource about the real estate professional rules. I know whenever I was looking into my real estate professional status, it wasn't very helpful because you just read the exact same thing on every single web page of, you know, this is what the IRS says. And my response was, well, what does that mean? And the answer was, <laughs> good luck figuring it out. Um, so uh, <laughs> you can see that two-page resource they have at renttoretirement.com forward slash tax. You can also sign up for the $97 initial tax planning evaluation that, as Zach mentioned, is at an 80% discount for rent to retirees. So really appreciate y'all taking the time with us today. For everybody else, thank you for listening to the show. Thanks for sticking with us for this, uh, probably our longest episode yet, Um, but it's a a topic that requires a lot more depth. So uh, check us out at renttoretirement.com. Don't forget to leave a review on your podcast platform. Really appreciate the time you've spent with us to educate yourself, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.